Hello, I'm Beth. Thanks for tuning in. On today's Read Remark, we're going to talk about three good short stories that were written in the 1950s. So the good news about stories written in the 1950s is that a lot of the better ones are available on public domain or for free to read or even listen to on sites like LibriVox or even the Department of Libraries or some colleges will have PDFs of them available out on the interwebs. All it takes is just a few seconds of Googling and you can find a lot of these, but I will also provide links to the free versions of all three of these short stories from the 1950s in my show notes as well. So let's dive right in. So when you think about the 1950s, there was a lot going on at that time. There was the Civil Rights Movement. Um, this was when schools were still segregated and slowly and controversially becoming desegregated. There was Brown versus Board of Education, in which the Supreme Court ruled that separate schools were not equal schools as far as race was concerned. And that was the decade that Rosa Parks refused to sit at the back of the bus. It was also the age of the baby boomers. Um, people had come back from World War II and were having babies like crazy. And so now there are all these other things to take into consideration with the increased population. Uh, there were overcrowded schools. You had to have increased agriculture to feed all of these people. There was a lot to think about with the baby boomers. Another significant thing was the Cold War. In fact, very significant, especially in a couple of the stories I'm gonna talk about. They were under a constant and very real threat of nuclear obliteration. I asked my dad about it. He was a very small child during the worst of the Cold War threat when it, it seemed like any day they were going to get just bombed to, to nothingness. And he said that it was a pretty regular occurrence to, at the end of the school day, just say to your schoolmates, bye, I hope I get to see you again tomorrow, and then go home. He said his parents didn't really talk about it much, although thinking back to it, I wish I could ask my grandma about it because it must have weighed really heavily on her mind to think about that as an adult living through such uncertain times. And so it's, a, it's important to keep those things in mind when thinking about these three short stories that were written during the 1950s. The first story is There Will Come Soft Rains. It's by Ray Bradbury, and it's named after the poem of the same name by Sarah Teasdale. This is a science fiction story, which isn't too tough to guess, considering it came from the great mind of Ray Bradbury. The book is actually based in 2026, and it's so fascinating to see uh, the 1950s idea of what the future will look like. If you ever have some free time, go to YouTube and look up The House of the Future. I, I believe that they made at least one or two videos in the 1950s with predictions on what they thought houses would look like nowadays, and it's just so interesting. And so the house in this story is a fully automated house which actually doesn't sound too far off from what we have, although theirs takes it a step above what we have. Um, they have an alarm clock that will just verbally call out different times of the day and what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, hello, Alexa or Google Home. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't just set off your devices. They have um, ovens that will go ahead and prepare meals for them and get them plated and on the table for them. I wish we had that. And then after mealtime is over, they have a big metal scraper that will just come and take all the meals off the plate, clean it up, and then they'll have little mice that sound kind of like a Roomba, um, electronic mice that will come out and get up any sort of detritus or dirt that's left on the ground and then go safely back into the hole. About midway through the day, we get a shot from outside the house and it shows what happened to the people. We see that this is the only house left on the block from all around. It's nothing but just fields and to the point that at night it emits a radioactive glare. On this house that's left, you see this outlined silhouette of the family. You see the father mowing the lawn, the woman bending over to pick some flowers, the kids playing. It's all silhouetted against the side of the house and kind of the outline of it is just ash. So you can kind of get the idea that the people and everything around them were just completely obliterated by this nuclear blast. Uh, this radioactive nuclear blast that shone just brightly enough that it imprinted the images of the people upon the house. We're obviously living in a post-apocalyptic world at this point, and by living I mean complete human extinction. 
Later that night, the house begins putting out all the pieces of uh, the evening entertainment for the family, so martinis, card games. The house asks the lady of the house which poem she would like to hear for tonight, and not getting any sort of response uh, defaults to the woman's favorite poem, There Will Come Soft Rains. I'm going to read it to you real quick. Forgive me for looking at my phone, but I don't have it memorized. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound and frogs in the pools singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire whistling their winds on a low fence wire and not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. And so we see this is exactly what's being lived out in this empty house right now. Humans are gone. Nature is keeping on, keeping on. It's, it's making no difference to nature whatsoever. In fact, as the poem is being recited, a tree comes down, crashes into the house. The house, with all of its automated things, spills cleaner, bursts into flames, explodes. There's nothing left of the house anymore except for a few automated voices. It's, it's science fiction. It, it's set in the future, but really it looks at a reality that for them at the time in the 1950s was pretty real. They thought that, you know, even if they don't have the automated houses, that a, a big flash could come and envelop them at any time and nature would just keep going on careless that they had ever existed pretty heavy number two is a good man is hard to find by flannery o'connor this story was actually recommended by another booktuber better than food books he gave a really good synopsis a free link to the story and a really good analysis probably better than the one i'm about to give so i would highly recommend that you go watch that as well i'm going to link to it in the show notes this story is not science fiction it actually looks at the more traditional family life and then the very, very dark underbelly or the very dark things that can happen to disrupt that wonderful traditional family life. So in it, there's a regular family, mom, dad, kids, baby, grandma, living together, and they decide to go on a road trip. The grandma kind of represents the worst of the 1950s. She's still very set in her ways, not really willing to accept change, not willing to accept people different than her that much unless they fit within her own social constructs. Really um, quick to turn up her nose, slow to apologize or admit fault. Perhaps her values are misplaced. So they go on this road trip. They get in a bad wreck along the way. Grandma's fault, even though, of course, she doesn't admit it. And they're stranded on the side of the road. Remember, this is the 1950s. It's before the days of cell phones. Finally, a friendly car stops to help them. They're out in the middle of nowhere, so really, it could have been anyone. It could have been no one. They could have been stuck there. Turns out, the car that stopped to help them was the misfit, the escaped serial killer, and his misfit friends. Grandma is trying to kind of talk her way out of this. And this is where readers kind of diverge on what the grandma's uh, MO was at this point. She was telling the misfit, I can tell you're a good man. Some people think that maybe she was trying to convince him to be good. Some people thought she was trying to slyly talk her way out of it. Some people thought that she genuinely thought that she was going to change him. She genuinely was seeing the good in him. And she, in the end, was the one who was transformed. I think maybe the grandma still had her head in the sand and she was trying to convince him as well as herself that that truth had to be the truth because it was the only one that would fit into her mind. He had to be a good man because the alternative was that the entire family gets brutally murdered, which is what ended up happening. Very dark story. Very dark. Especially considering the way that 1950s home life was portrayed in the media. Everything was very hunky-dory, coiffed hair, men always wearing ties, everyone just very well-mannered, the children saying yes ma'am, no ma'am, never dirty, uh. <laughs> and then the parents giving each other a loving smile and going to their separate twin beds at night. That's not the reality of the way life was, and Flannery O'Connor was not afraid to go dark, 
very, very dark, even though maybe she was living that traditional life herself. Moving on, The Cold Equations by Tom Godwin. This is also a science fiction one, and this is one of my all-time favorite short stories. I actually read it back in school, and still now, years later, it stays with me. Thanks, teachers. So in the story, a guy is on a rocket ship. A rocket! How can you start any better than that? Unfortunately, the rocket is on a rescue mission. He's going to save the Earth with supplies and escape. All sorts of help that he's going to give the planet because, of course, the planet is about to self-destruct. Remember, the 1950s was a period of Cold War and social unrest, so it probably felt like things were just coming apart all over people. All over people. So it probably felt that things were coming apart for a lot of people. So in this story, the planet's about to go berserk. It's about to go, it's about to be voted off the island. It's about to leave everything behind and just go belly up. If this rocket doesn't get to it in time to save it with much needed supplies and help from this single man on this destined, important, vital mission. While he's on the rocket, he discovers a stowaway a young teen girl who has come with him because she wants to get to the planet with him to see her brother and help him and be reunited with her family. She's sweet. She's innocent. Unfortunately, she's extra weight that the rocket cannot carry. This is the ultimate ethical question. He has the choice to either get rid of her, you know, exit her off the plane to certain death and then be able to make it to the earth and save all of those millions of people or he can keep her with him, but that extra weight on the rocket will mean that the rocket won't make it to Earth. It'll burn up in the atmosphere. It won't save the millions of people. They'll die. All those people will die. Everyone will die. It will mean certain destruction for everyone. The answer is obvious, even to the girl, and she's heartbroken, but she understands. But still, it's it's so sad. It's such a horrible situation to be in. You shouldn't have to sacrifice the one to save the many because sometimes the one is really sweet and really special. But it's just what has to be done in the story. So yeah, I just spoiled that one too. <laughs> you were warned. Really good emotional story. Science fiction with all the feels. Science and emotion great combination. So there you have it. Three good short stories from the 1950s. There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. A Good Man is Hard to Find by Flannery O'Connor. The Cold Equations by Tom Godwin. I highly recommend you read all three of them. They're short. They're free. There's nothing stopping you. Do it. <laughs> I'll see you all next time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye.